Yarrow is a member of South Australia and Northern Territory Regional Meeting and was a clerk of that meeting for six years and a former clerk of Hong Kong Meeting. They tell me that they could not have made it to this point without their family and friends, particularly their partner Emily, and acknowledge that we are only ever as capable as the communities who surround us. We will begin this session with a period of silence. It's not our tradition to applaud at the end of these lectures, and instead we will finish with another period of silent worship. I will speak briefly after that period of silent worship to draw our time together to a close. When I was asked by the Backhouse Lecture Committee whether I would do this, I felt immediately dismayed. I wanted to look over my shoulder to catch a glimpse of the person they were really talking to. At that time, I was deep in climate despair, feeling the lack of impact of all forms of climate action. In the face of a government entrenched in denial. Sorry, entrenched in climate denial, um, in, um, graft and duplicity. Who was I to offer any sort of message to others? Yet having embarked on this journey through the support of a clearness committee, I began a series of climate conversations with other activists, Quaker and non-Quaker, that helped me see beyond my despair. These activists helped me to see that all of us who care about the planet must wrestle with moments of despair and take action nonetheless. As well as these conversations, I was immersing myself in writing by people of the global majority who were also pondering this crisis. And this helped me realize that we all have a story to tell. And if we are lucky, people to listen. Their wisdom echoed in my brain as I was writing, making this narrative richer and more truthful to a complex reality. As you listen to this story, please know that I will include moments of silence, honoring our Quaker practice of using silence to wait for our inner voice. Do not be alarmed by these silences, but rest in them, seeking to understand your truth within my story. Together we must grasp this critical moment in history, being guided by the words of Micah. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? How can justice, kindness and humility tell a new story about the future? of our beautiful planet. Whose story am I telling? In one sense, the only story I can tell is my own. I am Yarrow, a Quaker, 
an early childhood teacher, a sociologist, a non-binary and queer person, an activist and a gardener. I could give myself many more labels, but these are some of those I feel most deeply and also those most relevant to what I am saying today. I have white skin, which gives me substantial privilege wherever I am in the world. I will be less likely to be poor, to be imprisoned, to be rejected as an asylum seeker, or to be insecurely housed. I will be free to pretend that racism, both interpersonal and systemic, does not exist, and most of my privileges will be invisible to me. I could tell stories about other forms of unearned privilege and how my thought patterns and behaviours growing up were shaped by these. It was only as an adult and through my training as an academic sociologist, as well as my involvement in feminist, queer and climate activism, that gave me some insight into this privilege and helps me in unlearning some of these patterns. I feel fortunate in the present day to identify as non-binary, despite the grief I felt about this growing up. Nonetheless, I feel fortunate because this has helped me understand in some ways the absence of privilege and so have more empathy towards the majority of my fellow human beings for whom gender, race, indigeneity, class, disability or age may be held against them. Later in this narrative, I will tell you stories about climate justice, but for now I will try and paint a picture of climate injustice and the ways in which it perpetuates itself. To talk about climate injustice is to open our eyes to the horrifying realisation that not only are we damaging the precious ecosystems of this planet, but in the process we are exacerbating injustice everywhere. As one of my climate conversationalist Mary explains it, I think of it as an approach to understanding and responding to the climate crisis that puts the voices, perspectives and experiences of people who are at the front line and most vulnerable at the heart of how we understand the climate crisis and how we choose to respond to it. For example, that means if we're not thinking about how this crisis will affect Indigenous and First Nations people, who've been on the front lines of this crisis all along, then our perspective is not much good. If we're not putting the perspectives of young people who are disproportionately going to live with the outcomes of this by comparison with those of us who are older, then there's a problem. And if we're not thinking about people who are already poor, the global poor as well as the local poor, if we're not thinking about them first and foremost, then we're not addressing the problem. And actually, if we're not thinking about people whose jobs depend on extractive industries, then we're crippling our capacity to move forward. Mary's insights help us see the people who are most impacted by this crisis, the poor, the young, First Nations, who all understand their vulnerability clearly and are trying to get the world's attention. It is likely that we have been changing the climate for a long, long time. Some scientists see the beginning of this in humankind shift into agriculture and domestication of animals. This seismic shift in human culture led to the cutting down of forests, which once covered nearly all the continental land masses below the snow line. For many thousands of years, deforestation was humanity's only contribution to climate change. Many human communities develop systems and cultures that aim to preserve and protect the land, which was and is viewed as home, mother, and spiritual foundation. Yet some human cultures challenge the notion that the land is sacred. From the days of the empires, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Mayan, some human communities have reached out to conquer and subjugate neighboring countries. Early human wars saw crops burnt, farmland salted so as to become useless, and forest, forests pushed back to create defensible zones and military routes. These early waves of colonization spread plants and domesticated animals into new places, disrupting and changing local ecosystems. 
Conquest and warfare create conquered populations, many of whom were enslaved. Conquered populations then create resentment and revolt and become the cause of future wars and rebellions. As Quakers, we have a long-standing opposition to both war and slavery, knowing that both of these treat some people as dispensable, rather than as a part of the divine, a reflection of God. These hurtful practices are part of the larger story of climate injustice that has damaged not just human beings, but also other than human creatures, plants and fungal communities. Fast forwarding a couple of thousand years, we find our human capacity for innovation, embracing new thinking and different forms of knowledge. This was the time of the Reformation, revolutions and the Renaissance, all times of change or re-examining our place in the world. When scientific thought supplanted religious authority, this was accompanied by a massive expansion in technology. Advances in shipbuilding enabled the crossing of oceans once thought to be endless, and technologies such as gunpowder tipped the scales heavily in favor of those who could acquire them. A new era of colonialism was born, whose ramifications continue to haunt all of us, both colonized and colonizers. These conquests, mostly by people with pale skin over people with black or brown skin, led to a massive expansion of slavery and the transport of millions of African people to the Americas and beyond. This was a time when science sought to justify racial injustice through proving that those being conquered and enslaved were barely human at all. Systemic racism was born and continues to benefit people who look like me or those who pass as white. These technologies built an industrial revolution as well as a social revolution, with many leaving rural areas to work in city-based factories. Those early days of industrialization had no regulations. Workers were killed in machines they were operating. Pollution flowed freely from factories into the street and then into local watercourses, lakes and seas. This was the era of coal, which was burnt in steam engines, in domestic fireplaces and powered many of these new factories. Mining these natural resources, not just coal, but also metals, rock and sand, disrupted and polluted ecosystems and drinking water. It led directly to the deaths of many from diseases like black lung. Then as now, those living nearest to the sources of these pollution were the poor, with this poverty causing sickness as well as stunting development to their children. The conditions of crowded slums also exacerbated early epidemics, such as cholera or smallpox, leading to further misery. Extractive capitalism has been tightening its grip ever since, because our dependence on fossil fuels entrenches its power. Having accumulated vast profits without being responsible for any of the costs, such as environmental or social damage, these fossil fuel giants now spend significant sums distorting democracy to maintain their destructive practices. This era of revolutions in industrialization was not all doom and gloom. As a human culture, we have struggled towards better forms of governance with tools such as democracy, systems of legal precedent and independent judiciaries, as well as the ongoing extension of human rights. These tools have allowed activists to wrestle with many aspects of injustice, including climate injustice, as seen in the legal cases regarding climate pollution being taken up in modern times. Our governments now have considerable power, people power, if only they were willing to wield it. We saw a graphic demonstration of this during the early days of the pandemic, when the worst forms of poverty and homelessness were virtually eradicated at the stroke of a pen, with a doubling of social security payments and the provision of hotel accommodation to those sleeping rough. There is much our governments can do if they would only choose to take action on behalf of the powerless. 
Some climate injustice is deliberate in the exploitation of majority world workers or the offshoring of polluting production. Other effects are more accidental, but just as consequential. Changing climates destabilize countries, leading to war and conflict, exacerbating the flow of refugees, as happened most clearly in Syria or Afghanistan. The flow of refugees then has the potential to spark racism and protectionism in those countries that they are fleeing to, as has happened in the last couple of decades in Australia. The overheating of our planet creates a need for better housing to mitigate climate extremes, but it is the poorest people who can least afford to access this housing. Many of these folk are poor due to age, racism, dispossession, disability, or other forms of discrimination. Indeed, there were many who lost their homes in the 2019 to 2020 bushfires who were living regionally because this was where they could afford to live and who those who are still struggling as a result. These climate impacts are real and they are happening now, whether close to home or across the globe. Millie told me that the climate crisis became starkly real for her when being forced to flee from those bushfires. As she recalls, for the last 10 years, I've been anxious every summer. But that summer, the 2019 to 2022 summer, when we got evacuated from Tathra was like, I think for many people, it was like we were literally breathing in the ashes of dying things. And I think that was the experience. We were always safe. We were never any of the people who were really stuck, but we evacuated that night on New Year's Eve night in this apocalyptic thick smoke and then had to make a dash to Canberra on New Year's Day before the highway closed. Millie is keenly aware that scenarios like this will be repeated again and again, whatever our efforts to alleviate the crisis. As Quakers in Australia, we are a predominantly, though not entirely, white and middle class group of people. We do not want to think about our privilege and so we frequently focus instead on our testimonies to equality, simplicity and peace, or our long time commitment to many justice movements. Though we feel pride in our early activism against the slave trade, we did not in the end draw many ex-slaves into our meetings and our friendship networks. In a similar way, the climate movement has become dominated by white people mostly because it is white folks who have the freedom from economic hardship and the available time to participate in climate activism. We are also the people who mainstream media pay most attention to entrenching this problem. This is not because people of color do not care about climate activism. As Mary Anais Hegler observes, it's not just time to talk about climate, it's time to talk about it as the black issue it is. As she explains, climate change takes any problem you already had, any threat you were already under, and multiplies it. Problems such as systemic racism, disproportionate incarceration, state violence, such as with the stolen generations, and financial insecurity, these are all being made worse by this ongoing crisis. Most active climate activists become familiar with despair and I am no exception. But this is not just my own story. Each of the conversations I have with other activists was an enriching experience, helping me sit with the issues I was exploring and understanding more deeply how many ways there are to step into the activist life. Within this extended community, I could understand better how injustice perpetuates itself in a broken world. This injustice has many impacts, and those that I spoke to during my preparation for this talk described their own journeys into and out of despair. 
One of the impacts despair has is on our spirit and our sense of spiritual connection. Much of this is based on a deep understanding of the earth as sacred. To see it continually being degraded, polluted or over harvested can feel like our world suffers from willful blindness to the awe-inspiring complexity and beauty of our planetary home. A number of those I spoke with understood their despair in spiritual terms and drew on their faith to uphold them in those moments. Perry said, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't have moments of despair and I don't always deal with it as well as I should. You know, sometimes I just get unbelievably angry. There are days when, when I see the oblivi oblivion of people to what's happening, happening and it's infuriating. But mostly what I do is go out in the salt marshes and sit and have a listen. You know, you can reach that of God anywhere. You just have to stop. It really doesn't matter where you are. And if you stop and listen, you will hear the little stirrings of the world around you. And you know the world is working so hard to pull itself back into equilibrium. Habiba has come to a similar conclusion when despair strikes. As she explains, I do have moments of despair and I've been learning to sit with it instead of immediately trying to distract myself from it because it comes with a lesson. It doesn't come on its own and it's not shallow. I've had to learn a lesson. Despair always challenges us spiritually because it seems to reveal the hollowness of what we believe and how we are living. However, we can take away its power by sitting with that feeling, acknowledging it and seeking to find the truths beyond it, the lessons it may offer, such as the incredible regenerative capacity of the earth, which Perry sees so clearly. Elizabeth was skeptical about both hope and despair, seeing both of them as something of an illusion. On the subject of despair, she reflected, there is behind despair a rightness about the awfulness that we are witnessing because of everything that has gone before that we of human, as humans have created. Hope and despair are not separate from each other in that regard, they both represent a wholeness. I know that there's a huge redress that is required to make the earth anywhere near habitable for the foreseeable future. In seeing through the false comfort of hope and the apathy of despair, Elizabeth instead chooses to notice what is needed, a healing of planetary ecosystems. For some people, their despair appears to hit them at an emotional level. What are sold as climate solutions are often far from the answer. She realizes, I'm gonna die and I might as well go sooner rather than later. She also says that she knows people who read the IPCC reports and the despair that they feel, but she chooses not to read them. I don't go there. Maybe I would do more activism if I did read them all, but it seems there's enough suffering going on right now that I can turn my attention to. Monica sees that it's not just climate change, but the loss of habitat and the greed of humanity just taking more and more. Jerry immediately honed in on the emotional aspects of despair and the many ways it can impact upon us. As he explained, I've had some fairly intense periods of despair. I know physically I feel weighed down. I've become nonverbal, close to tears, if not crying. And the worst is when I come to this space of, I feel like saying, oh, fuck it. I feel like I can't do it anymore, so I'll just turn off. I'll do what I see other people do, and just turning off. As he notices, many people cannot deal with the reality of this climate emergency, and so shut it out, refusing to see it or feel its impact. Lynn is also hit hard, saying, the despair that I feel has a lot to do with working with racism and how people don't make that connection to the climate. It's like an unconsciousness, a holding onto a privilege, that climate change is a problem which is over there for them to deal with, keeping ourselves separate from the problems facing other people. Continuing on, she explains, the impact that it has is body-based. 
It makes it hard to get out of bed in the morning. I feel tired and lethargic. There's a sense of a weight on me that I'm repeating myself over and over again and that I've been doing it for many years. That's my despair. It's a very deep one. And the only, only way I can get through that is through relationship. Lynn identifies here one of the most robust antidotes to despair, which is to connect with others, especially in taking action. In doing so, we are reminded that we are not alone, nor are we powerless. Others see the impact of despair at the level of community, feeling frustrated that humanity has failed to grasp the significance of the existential crisis facing us. As Garth mused, why don't we just do better? Garth's experience as someone who has had a long-term chronic illness offers us a fresh perspective on how we might respond to despair. As he goes on to say, when I got sick, there's a sense where I've already gone through my own personal apocalypse. So it's kind of like, how much more can climate take from me over what I've already lost? And having already lost that, actually my life is still pretty good. There's, there's all these things that make my life good, having a secure place to live, a loving wife, and having financial security, stuff like that. But also part of the process of having this kind of illness is that I've kind of given up on planning. I don't have dreams for the future because it's kind of pointless. Well, I wouldn't be able to, I tried to, but it's frustrating because I can't actually achieve that. So in the same way that I don't have dreams for the future, I kind of don't worry about the future anymore either because I'm like, well, we'll deal with that when we get to it. Garth's personal predicament forces him to stay grounded in the present and able to feel grateful for what he does have, rather than imagining the sorts of doom-filled scenarios often propagated by climate activists. Learning from Garth, I can ask myself, how might I act meaningfully in the current moment? trusting that these actions will make a difference, even if I cannot see how the future will play out. I will still feel the emotional impacts of emerging disasters, the fires and floods, the destabilization of governments, the breakdown of societies, but I can choose to engage now, making sure I stay connected and build relationships with those around me. I can also respond spiritually, using the tools that our spiritual practice has, offer, has to offer us to settle me amid the turmoil and to notice that despair is always a possibility, but it does not have to consume me. My own despair is felt most keenly when responses to the climate emergency deeply fail the marginalized of the world. Right now, May 2, 2022, I am noticing and feeling the pain of those who are going hungry due to rapidly rising food prices, driven in part by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This is impacting the global poor and is felt especially hard by First Nations people in remote communities, where the costs of fossil fueled freight are a much larger proportion of the costs of food. I am not living on the margins and do not yet feel many of the impacts of this climate emergency. The ugly truth is that those who have most power to change the trajectory we are on are most blind to the damage we are doing. This is everyone from the world's billionaires competing in a futile space race to politicians who ignore the suffering of those whose circumstances of birth made their poverty almost inevitable. When I was a young adult, I wanted to believe that Australia was not a racist country, choosing to see racism only elsewhere, such as in the legacy of slavery in America. It took older and wiser friends of mine particularly one of my early childhood education mentors, Dr. Glenda McNaughton, to help me see the truth. 
She patiently argued with my stubbornness and ignorance, opening my eyes to the realities of racism in our country. This is the reality of white blindness, the blindness that comes from privilege. When you are privileged, you do not even see the problems because those problems do not touch your life. Most people with privilege choose to stay blind because that is the only way to feel comfortable with their privilege in a world where people starve, are killed and are humiliated to preserve the privileges that we hold on to. In trying to tell a story about climate justice, I know that I cannot rely on what I have seen, but must listen with an open heart to all those who are living with injustice. Justice has always been skewed in my favour and climate justice is no exception. Tyson Yunker Porter in his book, Sand Talk, draws on First Nations understandings, as well as the patterns of deep history to offer us a challenging truth. As he notes, city building cultures, whether in ancient times or today, are never indigenous cultures because the nature of cities is perpetual growth. They suck the life out of the lands around them in ways that First Nations people could not abide. As he explains, growth is the engine of the city. If the increase stops, the city falls. Because of this, the local resources are used up quickly and the lands around the city die. The biota is stripped, then the topsoil goes, and then the water. It is no accident that the ruins of the world's oldest civilizations are mostly in deserts now. It wasn't desert before that. Seeing through others' eyes has helped me connect to possibilities for the future that I would otherwise have overlooked. As Habiba explains, one of the most important things we can do is to extend our solidarity wherever and whenever we can. To recognize the inner light in more of those around us is to feel the increased urgency of action. We cannot afford to step away from this struggle. To combat the despair that many of us feel, we need to have a vision of the future we are aiming for if we are to turn this crisis around. I was made aware of the importance of this by Fabiana Rodriguez, who explained how easy it is to catastrophize, to imagine doom-filled scenarios. Yet these terrible visions only paralyze us, preventing us from seeing what we need to do now, what we can do to change the world around us. She called upon artists to create visions of the future, to inspire and entice us, calling out to our best selves and invigorating our struggle for a livable world. What we often fail to notice is that we are being sold, often quite literally, an impoverished and profoundly depressing consumer-oriented lifestyle. Most of this does not satisfy us for long and in the process damages the lands and waters of our beautiful planet. This is no accident. There is no profit in selling people what they really need because most of this is free. We want to love and be loved. We want times of connection and times of nurturing solitude. We want the work that we do, whether paid or unpaid, to be meaningful and valued by others. We want a world without fear and a world in which we do not have to be anxious about whether we have shelter or food. These things are possible for all, even with 8 billion people on this planet. I'm going to tell you some stories now. These are fictions, but built on the concrete wisdom of experts on how to turn this crisis around. Their purpose is to help us have a sense of our destination, where we want to believe we could end up. Collectively, I hope they will help you imagine what a better and more regenerative shared future might look like. I encourage you to imagine yourself listening to interviews with various ordinary Australians living in a 2035 where we did take up the challenge of bold and regenerative ac action. My name is Jill. 15 years ago, I was on the dole long term and let me tell you it was miserable. Finding a place to rent was a nightmare and paying bills when they just seemed to go up and up, it kept me awake at night. So these days I feel like I'm on easy street. 
Since the government's new climate jobs program, no one needs to be unemployed if they don't want to be. And it's great. I work with the same crew and life is always different. For the last few weeks, we've been transforming part of the old stormwater system into an urban wetland and water recycling program. This suburb and surrounding suburbs flooded in the 2022 and 2029 floods. And even though a lot of work has been done already to manage these extreme weather events, it was still touch and go when the floods came again here last year. We've been able to make a larger wetlands here because 14 house blocks were acquired in the flood buyback scheme in 2029 when people decided not to rebuild. We're almost done here. And while the rebirths will take some time to get established, I can imagine what it'll look like because another crew finished one near my place a few years back. And it's so beautiful. So many birds and frogs and dragonflies. It breaks your heart. We already know where we're off to next, our crew, which is a tree planting program a couple of hours out of the city. We'll get accommodation for the two weeks we're there and get to check in on the plants we put in last autumn. All this and getting a living wage as well. I think my daughter's gonna join the program herself because she loves the outdoor life and sees how happy I am. I used to be worried sick about climate change, not knowing what I could do so my kids would have a brighter future. Now I'm working to make that change and I couldn't be happier. Later today, we're being visited by one of the local kindergartens who are gonna join us in the final planting before we divert the stormwater in here permanently. So great to see the little tackers getting into it. Yamadu Marang. My name is Ellen Clements and I am one of the Wiradjuri elders in the management committee of our mining project. We see ourselves as world leaders in the field of ecological mining, although we have some friendly rivalry going with a Coast Salish group in British Columbia who might also make the same claim. We've never been after big profits, we're just happy to have good jobs for our kids to go into. Our aim is to honour our ancestors while also contributing to the resources need for the booming renewables industry. All our buildings and machinery are renewable powered, drawing mostly on our 500 megawatt community solar project. When I was still working as an engineer, I helped install this with funds from the treaty reparations process. We deliberately put our banks of solar panels on higher poles to allow room for wildlife to flourish underneath it. Our bilby population is booming and that means the quolls are too. I don't think most of our older rangers thought they'd be com combining their traditional work with solar panel maintenance, but it made sense to us to combine those roles and the young uns totally get it. I had hoped my son Dale would stick around to work on our mining project, but instead he's gone to be a teacher in the big smoke. Perhaps my daughter Narendra can get a job in our new battery plant when she finishes her chemical engineering degree. Like mother, like daughter, as they say. We're processing our own lithium. Lithium we know is being produced in ways that respect the land and all those who share it with us. Dale comes back every holiday though and tells me that the children love his stories about being back on country. Those children need to know about what our mob are doing. When he's finished his studies, I'm gonna see if he'll come back to work in our Garu early childhood program. Hi, my name's Daniel, and I wanted to tell you about our council's soil remediation program, which I coordinate. I'm a chemistry biology geek and never thought I'd end up doing work like this when I was a student back at the University of Iran. When I fell in love with an Aussie and migrated here, I took a postdoc with a team working on algal, algal and fungal bioremediation and saw the huge potential in this area. Our team helped develop some new strange, strains which are 30% more effective at dealing with fossil fuel contaminated soils. That may not sound like much, but trust me, in our field, that's revolutionary. I get people trying to head my head hunt me for work in remote mining sites, but for now, my partner grounds work means we'll stay in the city. I'm told by my colleagues that when councils used to re rehabilitate old petrol stations, we didn't have many options except to cap them with concrete and turn them into skate parks. Sure, the local skater kids loved us, but council felt we were just kicking the problem down the road. 
at our latest project, we, which used to be a 24 Bowser servo, we're just completing our final soil analysis and we found no traces of heavy metals or volatile organics after just 18 months of works. That's like the blink of an eye in bioremediation terms. After cracking a bottle of bubbly, we're just about ready to hand over to our council's green waste team, or dose it up with compost and work with a local urban land care group who tell us they've got tubes start raring to go. We can't wait to see how it looks as a nature play space for the nearby primary school. Friends, we could tell many stories of this near future. And in the booklet version, there are more. <laughs> I hope you can dream up some of your own. We need those stories as a mud map of where we are trying to get to. Our Quaker advices and queries have much to offer us, but for me, number 33 speaks most clearly to the concept of climate justice. Are you alert to practices here and throughout the world which discriminate against people on the basis of who or what they are or because of their beliefs? Bear witness to the humanity of all people, including those who break society's conventions or its laws. Try to dis discern new growing points in social and economic life. Seek to understand the causes of injustice, social unrest and fear. Are you working to bring about a just and compassionate society which allows everyone to develop their capacities and fosters their desire to serve? The words social unrest and fear speak loudly to our situation and we do not have to sit idle in response. I've tried to tell you some anecdotes of that just and compassionate society, one that we are called to create together. There are so many stories we could imagine and bring into being, and I hope you will bring your own creativity to this process. Hope is something we cannot live without, but as many of the activists I chatted with commented, hope is dangerous if it prevents us from seeing the real state of the world. Hope is sometimes a daydream, something we use to avoid our present and the problems we face. Rebecca Solnit in her book, Hope in the Dark, unpacks the idea of hope, reminding us of what it can offer and what it cannot. As she vividly describes, Hope is not a lottery ticket you can sit on the sofa and clutch, feeling lucky. It is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war and from the annihilation of the earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. To hope is to give yourself to the future and that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. I am here, friends, as an agent of hope to shove you out the door because these times we find ourselves in demand it. I cannot tell you that we will be all right, that humankind will find our way through this tangled web of international conflict, ecocidal fossil fuel companies, and pervasive inequalities. What I can ask, what I am asking, is that you step out of that door and put your best energies into resolving this crisis. We must do this together, both as Quakers in Australia, but also alongside the countless other inhabitants of our blue-green planet. This is not a new request. In 2008, the Earth Care Statement we adopted as a yearly meeting said we would need to commit to the demanding costly implications of radically changed ways of living. Indeed, I believe many of us have tried to change radically the ways we live, trying to reduce the impacts we make on our local and global ecosystems. 
Since that time, Australia has endured more than a decade of unnecessary and costly paralysis. Governments of every persuasion have failed to respond effectively to this crisis. We are not alone in this paralysis, nor is it an accident. As a nation state whose pillaging of First Nations land has given us access to vast stores of fossil fuels and other valuable mineral wealth, we have been a focus of ongoing manipulation by the bad actors in our community, the wealthy owners of companies who profit from the short and long-term destruction of our world. As Elizabeth warns us, I'm not sure that hope will lead us anywhere authentic. Perhaps I have a mistrust of hope as a tool of jollying us along or not seeing things as they really are. We must see the world around as it is, not how we wish it would be and open our eyes to the need for action. What do we have to lose? In one sense, we have nothing to lose by taking action, Expect, except our comfortableness as wealthy enough people in one of the wealthiest nations on earth. But in reality, we have everything to lose, a stable climate, our food sources, countless species of animals, birds, insects, amphibians, fish and plant life, a safe political environment, safe drinking water, freedom from war and the lives of our friends and family. This loss often terrifies us so much that we look away and distract ourselves with busy lives to avoid having to think of all these losses. But this climate crisis demands that we remain witnesses to all of these losses for the sake of those people on our planet whose lives are already being destroyed by this emergency. What do we have to gain? What we gain is the only habitable planet that we know of in the universe. This planet, our Earth, remains a precious gem of diversity, even now after decades of extinctions. The more we look closely at our planet, the more diversity we find, because life is abundant and creative, endlessly searching for new connections, new ways to live. We can and must learn to live within the absolute limits of a finite planet and ecosystems that can only adapt solely to changing climates. What we could gain, however, is a more deeply connected, spiritually enriching and emotionally satisfying existence. In such an existence, we will be learning how to restore ecosystems, make resilient human communities, and provide the necessities of life in ways that are fair for everyone. In such an existence, there will be no time for despair because we will all be needed to put our shoulders to the wheel. In writing this backhouse lecture, I have not been able to get out of my mind one of the parables told by Jesus in Matthew's gospel. It is very short, simply two verses and goes like this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. It would be easy to read this verse and think nothing of it because it is over so quickly. It has traditionally been interpreted to understand the pearl of great price to be the salvation offered by Jesus' life and death. Yet in this time of climate catastrophe, we can hear another meaning within these verses, which can speak to us both individually and collectively as a Quaker community. The pearl of great price is this precious planet of ours, unique and irreplaceable, a gift of the divine. This planet has supported and continues to support all the lives of creatures and humans we have ever known. Every culture and richness of human society, every tiny pocket of beauty and wonder. This parable reminds us that when we discover something of such value, nothing else matters. We can and should give up everything we have, every single material possession, in order to preserve such a treasure. This earth, our home, is the ultimate treasure, and we have been blind to its value.
now and now and now is the time to act. I could tell you that now is the time for us as friends to take action. This will always be true. The best time to act on climate change was 30 years ago with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, at which time the task would have been so much easier. Yet we have delayed, dithered and debated while those invested in the fossil fuel system have worked covertly and overtly to undermine even the smallest of changes. So we come to the current now in 2022. Some of those whose work I have read talk about the privilege of being alive now because there has never been a more consequential time to be alive. 100 years ago, there were less than 2 billion people on the planet and our impacts on the global, global climate were only measurable with difficulty. 100 years before that, they were almost imperceptible. We live at a pivot point of Earth's history when we can impact every life form on this planet from bacteria to blue whales. I have a request of you all in this awe filled and awful moment. Can we act collectively as if every life we know is at stake? Can we, friends? I cannot tell you what exactly this collective action will look like, but I can paint a picture for you based on the collective wisdom of all those I have read and spoken with. One useful guide is from our Climate Change and Species Extinction Working Group and the survey they asked us to take late last year. They outlined five main areas in which we can be working for climate action. The first of these is through lobbying people in power. The second is through indirect political action, such as letter writing or voting, in which we seek to influence through collective effort. The third is direct action, such as being part of protests, rallies, vigils, sit-ins, blockades, or whatever. A fourth is community building, whether this is in your street, neighborhood, or organization. And lastly, there is direct habitat restoration, such as tree planting projects, litter and pollution cleanup, or ways of supporting the health of local environments. I have not included in this list our individual actions to reduce our impact on the planet. I know that many people have been prepared to make some or many of these changes. However, that individual action can be a trap, focusing on our own lives rather than the public good. There is emerging evidence that the concept of a carbon footprint was actually a strategy developed by the fossil fuel industry in the 1990s to shift the blame from their own company's destructiveness onto individuals. This has been a successful strategy, undermining our sense of community and government responsibility and distracting many from the challenges we face together. I believe that each of us here, no matter what the constraints we face, could imagine ourselves taking action in one or more of those five areas. As Perry described it to me in the conversation we had, if we think of these five actions as the lifeboats we need to launch in the shipwreck of a climate emergency, then our path ahead is clear. We do not have to debate whether we want to get on a lifeboat. We just need to choose quickly which lifeboat we will jump into. I cannot dictate what action we take collectively as people of faith, but I do know that we can do more and we must do more. One key challenge I will lay before you friends is a financial one. We do support many causes, but we have given only what we feel we can afford to give, saving the rest for an unknown future. My challenge friends is that we wake up and notice that there is no time more critical than now that future has arrived. Our society of friends, along with every other human being on this planet, will never face a challenge this great. We should be spending every dollar we have now and in the few short years ahead to throw our utmost support behind the push towards climate justice. Whatever action we take collectively, it must be bold, matching the scale of this crisis. 
Whatever we do, we must not delude ourselves that time is on our side. Now, more than any time in our history, we must act and act powerfully in all the ways we can possibly imagine. George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, asked us in 1652, what canst thou say? Now, with all the words that have been written or spoken about this crisis, I will leave you with a similar question. What can we do? We will now enter a short period of silence and you may leave when you are ready. The Zoom will be ended for all in a few minutes. Let's finish with silent worship, friends. <laughs> 